The very latest from witnesses on the ground and all new details on the other locations across the city targeted in highly pre-planned attacks. A Paris restaurant, SWAT snipers poised to shoot, bodies covered with sheets. Paris's largest soccer stadium, a game in progress as bombs explode. Tonight, France under a state of emergency, the border sealed and the world on high alert. Good evening, I'm David Muir. As we come on the air here in the West tonight, Paris, of course, is now waking up to a fuller portrait unfolding of the horror there. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas. Paris, the city of light, tonight a city under attack, dealing with the deadliest violence to strike France since World War II. We're going to jump right in with the latest details as we know them at this hour. As of right now, from a Paris prosecutor, the reported death toll could now exceed 120. Eight of the attackers are now dead, seven of them by detonating their own suicide belts. We also have confirmation that attacks took place in six different locations. And of course that makes them no doubt carefully coordinated in the planning of, has, must have gone on for weeks, even months, nobody yet knows. Nobody yet has even claimed responsibility, at least officially. But this does come in a two week period where Jihadi John was killed by a drone attack. He was a symbol for ISIS. ISIS is claiming responsibility for planting a bomb on that downed Russian airliner two weeks ago and for the bombing in Beirut this week that killed 43 people. President Obama saying that ISIS has been contained but not decapitated. These attacks perhaps saying otherwise. And of course, Paris waking up as we mentioned to the right. morning papers and we have the headlines already. The headlines, l'horreur à Paris, the horror in Paris and cette fois c'est la guerre. This time, it's war. Another simply put, carnage in Paris. And President Obama, we've learned, has held a phone call with President Hollande of France, of course, uh, sharing with him the condolences of the American people. But we begin here tonight with how it all started, how it all began to unfold in Paris with what one eyewitness called a horror movie that just wouldn't stop. It was a typical Friday evening in Paris. People out for dinner, some heading to a soccer match, others heading to a concert for a night of music. Around 9 p.m. Paris time, the first reports come in of multiple deadly attacks across the city. Paris, under siege. The first attack reportedly occurs at a popular Paris restaurant. Le Carillon is described as a rustic canal-side cafe with live jazz music into the evening. Gunmen opening fire with automatic weapons, reportedly killing as many as 40 people. We were sitting right at the window when there were numerous gun gunshots directed at the window towards the restaurant that we were eating in. We immediately dropped to the floor with all the other diners. Bodies lying on the street outside the restaurant covered by white sheets. Authorities would later learn about three more similar attacks taking place in the same district of Paris. Across town, a soccer game between France and Germany was underway. The stadium packed with fans cheering on their teams. The president of France is also there. Just over 16 minutes into the first half, an explosion. That explosion so loud it stops players in their tracks. A stadium announcer tells the crowd to avoid certain exits due to, quote, events outside. I was attending the game and I heard uh, two very uh, loud explosions. Um, you might be aware, if you've seen some uh, soccer games, that uh, sometimes there are explosions but are just uh, fireworks and they uh, sound pretty loud but they're not uh, dangerous. This time around, the explosion uh, was so loud we thought something uh, wrong probably happened. The French president is stunned, his hand to his face. He is evacuated from the stadium to safety. Police later find evidence that at least one of the explosions was carried out by a suicide bomber, one of three attackers who died near the national stadium. A little more than five miles away at the Bataclan Concert Hall, the maximum capacity 1,500, the American band from California, Eagles of Death Metal, is on stage performing. This Instagram photo taken just before multiple gunmen stormed the theater taking at least 100 concertgoers hostage. It's believed there might have been many more. A brother of one of the bandmates speaking out tonight. Uh, he said they were playing about six songs into the show, and um, they heard, before they saw anything, they heard uh, automatic machine gun fire, and, uh, you know, so loud, it was louder than the band. On Facebook, a harrowing post from someone inside the theater saying that he was seriously injured and that there are still survivors inside. They're killing everyone, one by one, he wrote. French authorities asking families across their nation to stay indoors. Sur ma décision, 
As French President Hollande orders the country's borders closed, social media lights up. Tweets from across the globe, so many famous faces expressing support, solidarity, sending their prayers. Hillary Clinton tweeting, the reports from Paris are harrowing, praying for the city and families of the victims. Donald Trump said, my prayers are with the victims and hostages in the horrible Paris attacks. May God be with you all. Here in the U.S. at 5.45 Eastern Time, President Obama addresses the nation. France is our oldest ally. The French people have stood shoulder to shoulder with the United States time and again. And we want to be very clear that we stand together with them in the fight against terrorism and extremism. 11.30 p.m. Paris time, explosions are heard outside the concert hall. Elite French police troops have begun storming the theater where that American band was performing. On that band's Facebook page, a post telling fans, we are still currently trying to determine the safety and whereabouts of all our band and crew. Just after midnight, reports that the siege on that theater is over. At least 100 people have been killed, according to French media reports. Four terrorists confirmed dead. Three of them in that concert hall detonating suicide vests. Tonight, in the face of such horror, already signs of French fortitude. While leaving the soccer stadium, these fans singing the French national anthem. We're back now, and they initially thought there were three or four locations. We now know at this hour there were six locations, as you mentioned off the top, across the city of Paris. And one of those locations, a restaurant where they were eating dinner on a typical Friday night in Paris. That's right, a Cambodian restaurant crowded that night. And joining us now on Skype is one of the women who was at that restaurant, Charlotte Breo. And Charlotte, 14 people were killed. That's a small restaurant. It was packed tonight. What did you see? Where were you sitting? I was sat right against the windows, so next to the street where the gunman came towards. Um, I was sat with one friend and we immediately heard really, really loud gunshots. Everybody dropped to the floor in confusion and it, it felt like it wasn't happening. It, it, it didn't feel real. Um, I'm actually shocked to hear how many people were dead because it, it, I, wasn't, I wasn't really aware. Um, that the people had so many people had been fatally wounded. The first realization I had was I I was holding on to a woman on the floor with me, and I I, I was asking her if she was okay, holding her hand, and I, I I realized she wasn't breathing or she was struggling to breathe. And then I, as I could look, finally look up, when I felt safe enough to look up, I realized she there was a pool of blood surrounding her, and I think she'd been shot in the chest. Awesome there was a woman thing. who was being carried by her boyfriend across the street when, when I when I went to leave the restaurant. It was really awful, really awful. Awful scene, as you describe it. We were glad that you survived it, Charlotte. And you didn't hear the attackers say anything because they were driving by when they opened fire on this small restaurant? Yeah, I, I mean, I wasn't aware that they were driving by, but they didn't come in. Um, they, uh, they, they didn't come in they, into the restaurant. They were just outside. It did seem like they'd stopped um, and then they went to reload their guns and then there was another round. Um, so it was slightly slightly delayed, but they, they didn't come in. And Charlotte, at that point, at, when they stopped to reload, what happened in that restaurant? Did people try to run for safety? Were you stunned into <laughs> silence and paralysis at that point? Yeah, absolutely. It was paralysis. And it was almost, I think people were so confused and, and, and almost waiting for somebody to give some kind of directive and nobody nobody did because it was just such bewilderment. It was, an, you know, a, a really relaxed atmosphere there. It's a really lively area. It's full of young people. It, it just, no one was expecting it and no one knew what to do. So it was just horrific and sh shocking. Charlotte, we know the president of France tonight has asked families across Paris now to stay indoors. All public buildings will be closed beginning tomorrow. Government buildings, museums, schools for the foreseeable future. Uh, what is it like when you look out your windows tonight? Uh, simply a stunned community across Paris? Yeah, uh, yes. I mean, all night I, I, haven't, I haven't slept. I've just been listening to ambulances driving around. I only live 15 minutes from the restaurant and 15 minutes from the concert hall. So I'm, 
I'm really in the thick of it. And I, I imagine that everybody's feeling the same. And actually the feeling I felt is at feeling, I, I feel it's similar to the atmosphere that was in Paris in January during the Charlie Hebdo attacks, just people feeling scared and unsure and um, yeah, it, just strange. And I'm just curious, Charlotte, how did you get out of there? I mean, what did you, and when you did get out of there, what did you see? Uh, well, my first priority was my friend. I couldn't see him. He was under the table. So I, I, I tried to find him. And the minute I could see he was okay because I was worried he'd been shot. The minute I could see he was okay, I just told him, get up, get up. I, I, I felt like they'd gone and I was just going with my instinct. And maybe it was, a, it was, a, it was a, luckily the right decision. They could have been still in the street, but they weren't. I just told him to get up, get his things and just go just run. And I know as I live close, we just ran straight to my house. So uh are we we were one of the first people to go but like i said everyone was in uh stunned and frozen on the floor no one no one wanted to move because people were scared it would happen something else might happen all right charlotte breo a astonishingly frightening evening for you tonight in the midst of that attack at a restaurant thank you so much for joining us but the most casualties were at a concert hall not far from where that restaurant was. A concert had just begun there by the American band Eagles of Death Metal when gunshots rang out. A huge venue with a capacity of 1,500 people, obviously on a crowded Friday night. They had just sung six songs when they heard automatic gunfire and the chaos began. It was a festive Friday night in Paris, and the American rock group Eagles of Death Metal were on stage playing at the Bataclan, a theater and concert hall dating back to 1865. Hundreds of fans had gathered when suddenly three or four gunmen reportedly carrying Kalashnikov rifles stormed in and started shooting into the crowd. The drummer later told his brother what they saw from the stage. He said they were playing about six songs into the show. I heard uh, automatic machine gun fire it was so loud it was louder than the band and they all kind of hit the hit the stage floor they saw men with machine guns just kind of shooting at any anything and everything there was a door i guess uh, back of the stage that led to a street and they flew out the back door witnesses reported that the shooting and slaughter continued for 10 minutes some escaping as the killers stopped to reload one witness claimed the gunman shouted, Syria. Ginny Watson somehow found her way out. But then the shots kept continuing. They kept going on. And then I saw people starting to panic. People were running away. And I could see from where I was, from the balcony, downstairs where the shots had come from, because I couldn't see anything. I just heard the shots. People were running away. And then all of a sudden, people on the balcony where I was sitting started getting up and panicking. And that's when I ducked, you know, I went behind the seats and the friend I was with, you know, I, I took her hand and we kind of made our way to an exit. While many audience members escaped amidst the horror and chaos, others were trapped behind, held hostage. Uh, at the time that they start killing individuals, and you know that they're killing individuals, uh, you must go in. FBI hostage negotiator Aaron Sanchez. You are thinking of how many lives could I possibly save by entering and how many more lives will be threatened. Just after midnight, French special forces assaulted the theater, overpowered and killed the gunman in a burst of gunfire and explosions, but not before at least 100 members of that audience were killed. Four of the gunmen were found dead in the theater, three by activating their suicide belts. Obviously, we know three of those terrorists were prepared to die, at least three prepared to die for their attacks tonight. People who were on the scene after they uh, were, it managed to get in and storm that scene called it a bloodbath. It looked like a war zone. In this case, the decision to go in, they were sure these terrorists meant to kill inside. It was a matter of we've got to go in now, even though people will die and save the, as many as we can. And you and I have reported many times on these situations and often it's a real struggle with whether or not you go in or not based on the fact that people could lose their lives in the efforts to save them. We want to bring in Ginny Watson who was just in your report there Elizabeth mm -hmm. inside the concert hall and Ginny first of all we're glad you're okay and can you tell us can you describe the aftermath inside that concert hall? 
Um, all I can say is that I was there when it started. I was actually there for the concert because the Eagles of Death Metal are a band I really like. And I was there with a friend. And we were in the middle of the concert and all of a sudden this huge shootout started and it was a quite quite a high pitched shootout. Um, myself never being in a shootout in my life, I actually thought it was a joke. I thought the band was like playing um, a joke on us and I didn't believe it at first. But then I saw people screaming and I was on the first floor of the venue. I wasn't down on you know, at the bottom. So I I heard all the shots and they were consistent. There were a lot of shots and they didn't stop. And that's when I realized maybe we have to leave. And with my friend, I took her hand and we managed to, we ducked, we hid behind the seats and we managed to, um, you know, slip away through the safety exit that was near to where we were. Um, there was a panic but we managed to escape in the street. But there were people harmed, people were wounded, there were there was blood, and people were had, you know, bullet wounds in their legs. It was um it wasn't nice. We heard one eyewitness who was also in that theater with you, in that stadium, uh, in that concert hall with you, describe how the gunmen were going down and, and executing people one by well, one. Did you see anything like that? No. What's really crazy, and that's what's really um, keeping me awake right now, because it's like it's four o'clock in the morning here in Paris, and I can't sleep because I I feel so I feel so strange because the the, the weirdest thing is I didn't. I didn't like panic. I just heard. I didn't see the people. I just heard these consistent gunshots, which were Kalashnikovs, which I think we call them in English, Kalashnikovs. And they just kept going, 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 going. It was like bang, 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 bang. So no break to reload, nothing like that. Sorry? No break to reload. They just kept consistently firing over yeah, and over. They just kept firing. They just kept firing. And they were they were downstairs. It was obvious that we were on the first floor in the balcony, which we called the balcon in French. And it was obvious they were underneath. And I said to my friend, what the fuck is that? You know, sorry, excuse my language. It's like, what the hell is that? Sorry. And she was like, I don't know. And we didn't take it seriously. But then all of a sudden, everybody started panicking. And that's when real, we, we realized that it was serious and that those um, shooters were actually, you know, coming up to the first floor as well. And I don't know how, I mean, you know, the universe was in my favor, I don't know, but I managed to escape through a safety exit with a lot of other people without being harmed. And, you know, I crossed paths with people who were wounded. I, I, I saw a girl who had a bullet wound in her thigh. Some, somebody else was on the floor with blood everywhere. It was, it was, it was horrible. You know, Jenny, there have been reports that uh, the gunmen, the attackers were shouting as they were inside that concert hall. I'm curious, did you hear them shouting anything along with all that gunfire? And no. we have not seen any images from inside the theater, nor, quite frankly, do we really want to. But can you tell us no. how many people you think they might have been able to get to before the yeah, SWAT team's I, no, rushed in? I don't, think, I don't think anybody could have been filming at that particular time because nobody wants to be filming that. Um, the, main, the, main, um, en the main energy, the main flow was to get the hell out of there. Um, I didn't hear anything because I was, like I say, I was on the first floor, so I didn't hear anything. Um, I didn't hear any, anything. I didn't hear any religious things, nothing. No, I didn't hear anything like that. Um, all I know is that people were firing Kalashnikovs and that we had to get out. And was it pandemonium and, to get out? I mean, were people just, I mean, how was this? Yeah, it was and it wasn't. It was like people were panicking. like. A lot of people were crying and stuff, and it was a bit of a panic. But it wasn't, it wasn't like um, you know when people get trampled. It wasn't like that. Like I, I didn't feel trampled. I didn't feel squashed. All I know is that I made my way to the safety exit, which I saw. You know when I was actually there, I noticed it. You know because I always look where safety exits are because I'm kind of wary of crowds. And you know we were all going down the the, the stair the, the staircase to get out and. At one point, the people who were down towards the doors, they stopped them for a while saying, no, they're there. And then they opened them again like a minute later and right. everybody ran out. Everybody ran out in a panic. You know, we all ran out in different directions. And Ginny, you know that several people were held hostage inside there for several hours. You know how lucky know. you are you got out. 
I know, and the people who were held there as hostage were people I knew because the person I was with was a friend and she works within the music industry and her friends are the people who work there. And so since escaping, we, you know, we, we came back to her place and we've had messages and emails and Facebook messages from people who were in, you know, uh, trapped in the, um, um, uh, what do you call it in English? The... Um, uh, oh, I can't. I can't find the word in English. Like the place where you get changed. You know, as right, an artist. Right. The dressing rooms. Jenny Watson. Rooms, exactly. Jenny, thank exactly. you so much for joining us. What a frightening ordeal you managed to survive. Yeah. Thank you for describing it. And obviously, to our thank audience, we want to apologize for uh, some of the colorful language she used. She was obviously in an extremely um, frightening situation tonight, and yeah, was very honest in describing it. it. Be on a night like tonight, and we can right. understand why she's still up at 4 a.m. Paris time. Right. Can't imagine anyone in that city sleeping right now. I want to bring in ABC's Louise Duas, the producer uh, on the streets of Paris tonight. She's uh, not far from the theater. And, and Louise, you and I were talking earlier. You, you said you heard what sounded like many explosions as the SWAT teams raced into that theater, and, and clearly intelligence officials telling us that that the SWAT teams knew they had to get in there. That's correct. I heard about 12 loud bangs and shortly after uh, ambulances rushing towards the theater, uh, I was able to follow some of them uh, and I could see firefighters evacuating people from the second floor, uh, taking them to this makeshift hospital, uh, makeshift hospital in a cafe nearby. Uh, and I saw people, uh, you know, coming out looking terrified uh, uh, with blood all over their T-shirts, many of them on the phone, probably calling relatives. Uh, and really a, a sense of, of tragedy here on the streets of Paris tonight. And Louise, we can see the police presence as you spin your camera around there. Uh, you've been held back quite a ways earlier in the evening. Have they allowed you to get any closer? And have you had uh, any information from authorities there about what remains inside that concert hall? Uh, you know, obviously authorities fearing this death toll could go much higher. Uh, do we know anything about the people who were targeted inside? Well, following the, the terrorist attacks uh, on the Charlie Hebdo magazine in, in January, uh, police here are extremely careful. And so they've closed the whole neighborhood. And journalists, uh, citizens, no one is allowed to get any closer to the theater. Uh, so no, no information at this stage uh, on what is happening exactly right now. Uh, we did see, however, uh, some buses early on taking uh, all the people that have been evacuated to a nearby hospital uh, to be taken care of over there. Uh, but definitely a lot of security on the streets of Paris tonight. All right, ABC's Louise Dubois. And we do know that hospital workers across the city of Paris have been called in tonight, Elizabeth, to report to work. The metro has been closed down, the Paris train, as the whole city, in effect, has been shut down for the next several days, all government all buildings. Public, all public gatherings, grocery stores, gymnasiums, gyms, schools, museums, they're all closed down tomorrow. Parks. Uh, right now, uh, the borders are sealed in France. A state of emergency has been declared. And the question's now turning to who orchestrated this incredibly sophisticated attack. We're joined now by Pierre Thomas, our senior justice correspondent, who's been working his sources all evening. Good evening, Pierre. Give us the latest. Elizabeth, tonight, U.S. law enforcement and intelligence have begun the hunt for clues. They need to know who did this, and they need to know right now. The critical question tonight, who did it? On the short list of possibilities, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, in part because of recent history. Just last January, there was a spree of terror in France. Two brothers forced their way into the office of the French satirical newspaper Charlie Hebdo in Paris, killing 11 and injuring nearly a dozen more. In this video, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula claimed responsibility for the assault, and authorities say one of the two terrorist brothers had traveled to Yemen to receive training and funding from the Al-Qaeda affiliate there. Another gunman took several people hostage at a supermarket near Paris and was killed after police stormed the building. Authorities say they found evidence in the gunman's apartment that he was connected to ISIS. His partner fled France and is believed to have traveled to Syria. The tactics used in this specific attack are very similar to what we've seen in the past in attacks carried out by Al-Qaeda or ISIS. It's too early to tell for sure who conducted it now, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if it was either an Al-Qaeda affiliate uh, or uh, ISIS.
Al-Qaeda has been looking for ways to do a large-scale attack for years. They've most recently fixated on blowing up commercial airplanes since 9-11 when they conducted the most devastating attack in U.S. history. In recent months, Al-Qaeda has been working on a so-called undetectable bomb that could get past airport security. But authorities don't believe their bloodlust is confined to just aviation. Remember the attack in Mumbai, India in November 2008? Kashmiri militants believed affiliated with Al-Qaeda executed a series of coordinated attacks at commercial and retail outlets over a series of nightmarish hours. 164 people were killed and over 300 wounded. But perhaps the most active terror group on the planet right now is ISIS, consuming huge swaths of land in Iraq and Syria, forming the so-called Islamic State. Thousands of foreign fighters flowing into those countries with a social media campaign unprecedented recruiting people from around the world, including in the U.S. and Europe. More than 1,500 French citizens affiliated with ISIS, a quarter of the European total. This past July, a French-speaking member of ISIS appeared in this video, threatening that the group will bring slaughter to France. According to the Brookings Institution, France has the largest Muslim population in the European Union, approximately 5 million people. Half of them are believed to be under 24. Many first came to the country following the colonial wars of independence in the northern African countries of Algeria and Tunisia in the late 50s and 60s. Tensions have simmered for a long time. In 1961, the French police shot and killed some 200 pro-Algerian demonstrators. Some were thrown into the Seine River. Today, there are several Muslim population centers in the nation, but most notably the suburbs of Paris. Unlike so many U.S. cities where the suburbs are affluent, these areas are hotbeds of unrest. Over the last several years, there have been re real challenges in France as it relates to individuals coming from North Africa, coming from the Middle East, and assimilating into the French culture. This New Yorker magazine article described a region called Department 93 a large area of disaffected African and Arab populations who feel cut off from French society. According to the article, estimates are 60% of French prison inmates are Muslim, prime targets for jihadists. One of the challenges that the French government uh, and the French people will face in the days ahead will be to uh, ensure that hate crimes aren't committed against people who had nothing to do with this attack. U.S. officials have been operating at a high tempo for months, concerned about al-Qaeda bombers, ISIS, and so-called lone wolves who could strike at any time. The pressure incredible as they have to worry about all scenarios. All right, Pierre, thank you so much. We're joined now by Brian Ross. Uh, the big debate began within moments after the attacks tonight. Al-Qaeda, ISIS, what do you think? What are your sources telling you? Well, the, right now they are focusing on ISIS because of the raw numbers of ISIS has. As Pierre was reporting, mm. uh, more than a thousand sympathizers. Some have gone to Syria and Iraq, but others remain in France. There's just a wealth of people who would be available. And recently there have been threats from ISIS in the social media to bring slaughter to the streets of Paris. And what do you make of reports that some of the attackers inside that concert hall were yelling Syria as they were opening fire? Very telling. And, and the fact is tonight they have a DNA fingerprints and photographs of the dead attackers. They're being run through French and U.S. databases. By tomorrow, we'll have a much better idea. But you know, Brian, you've been reporting on this for quite some time, that the, the threat and the fear here in America, when you hear about those suicide belts that they detonated in the middle of a concert hall, these so-called soft targets, exactly. that is the real fear here at home as well. There isn't a place in this country right now where you can have a thousand people at a concert that would be able to defend against this similar kind of attack. We also have Richard Clark with us, former counterterrorism czar. And Rich, uh, talk about the sophistication of this attack, what it took to, to, to almost simultaneously have six different attacks go underway in, in Paris tonight. Well, the weapons themselves are not sophisticated. So I wouldn't call it a sophisticated attack, but a but complicated attack. A complicated attack, because they had to do five or six different targets uh, at more or less the same time. This indicates a group that has had training, and this is why I think it's, it's probably ISIS. It may be people who have returned from Syria, from fighting in Syria. Uh, they look like they have had training to be able to pull off this kind of simultaneous complex attack in the heart of a major city. We have, um, we have about four, at least probably four, maybe five of the terrorists killed so far. How many people, though, do you think were involved in this? Probably not many more than that. If we look at the 
only other attack in history that looks like this. It was the Mumbai attack in India, uh, where a handful of people tied up the entire city, a huge city, uh, by staging the, this kind of running attack and then ending up at one venue where they took hostages and did their last stand. Now, that actually was not Al-Qaeda. That, that was a Pakistani group. But this tactic is one that has been learned. And I think it's been learned very well by ISIS and practiced by ISIS in Syria and in Iraq. The interesting thing here is the French didn't see it coming. And the only way you can stop these attacks on soft targets is to know it's coming and arrest people before they do it. If the French didn't know who these guys were and didn't have any indication that the attack was about to happen, uh, that's very disturbing and frightening because it means we might be in the same situation where we know who the Al-Qaeda people are in the United States or we know who the suspects are, but we might not know all of the ISIS people. Dick, you bring up that, the very point that we were making earlier, which that is the frightening part. These are soft targets. So unless you catch them before, if you haven't, don't have the intelligence that you need before to track them down, I want to bring in Martha Raddatz, our chief global affairs correspondent, because Martha, Dick points out that this could be ISIS. They seem like ISIS uh, tactics that have already been learned. But the real fear that you bring up in the afternoon of reporting and the evening of reporting here uh, is that this might not be, that these groups uh, might be now competing with one another for global attention. It, it almost seems that way, David. Al Qaeda hasn't been in the news quite as much, certainly, and and certainly the U.S. administration is saying hardcore Al Qaeda has been done away with, but they want to get back. They want to make a big splash. So they're looking at all these possibilities. Now, I do think someone shouting Syria is possibly a very big clue. France, like the U.S., has been targeting ISIS in Syria. So that may give investigators some clue as to motive, because ISIS would certainly have motive here. One other key component of that concert hall was that that was an American band on stage from California. Uh, we do know that a relative of one of the band members from Georgia told our affiliate WSB that he learned that uh, his loved one is safe, that the band is safe, that they were able to get out through a back door, Martha? They were able to get out of a back door because they heard the gunfire and they immediately turned and ran. They had a stage door there because they could tell what was going on in that concert hall. So they turned and, and ran and that's very good for them because they are the lucky ones because we've already heard how many people died in that concert hall, at least a hundred, they're saying, within that concert hall itself. And talking about that concert hall, I'd like to bring in Brad Garrett, who's formerly with the FBI, has a lot of experience in these hostage situations. And Brad, talk us through the decision by French police, French SWAT teams, to storm that concert hall when they did. I mean, they had terrorists inside, armed to the hilt, killing people, and more than a hundred hostages. How long, how do you decide when to go? What's that What's the calculation there? It's all based, uh, Elizabeth, when you have enough information about what you're walking into, because the last thing you want to do is to walk into a booby trap. So I think they had enough time, obviously, to interview people that had escaped from the theater. What did you see? How many people did you see? How many people do you think they have shot, et cetera? Did you see explosives? Were they rigging doors? All those kinds of questions. While those debriefs are going on, then you have a team of techs, hopefully, that are either getting cameras or mics in there so they can hear and look at what's going on. Once you have that core information, you're probably going to go in because they all know, we all know, they're not coming out. They're either going to blow themselves up or we're going to kill them. And so, and there are obviously people that are bleeding to death. You want to get them out of there. So I think that once you get that core information, you, you've had reporting of multiple explosions. Those are flashbangs. The whole key is that is to disorient the bad guys. So when the flash goes out, it gives you enough time to draw a bead and shoot somebody. Really and and I think that's what happened. Yeah, an excruciating decision whether or not and if and when to go in. Brad, stick with us here. We have John Cohen, formerly with Homeland Security, an ABC News analyst. And John, a lot of people who are watching this here in America tonight want to know about football games this weekend. We've learned already of heightened security in this country uh, because of the real concern, as we mentioned earlier, over soft targets, you know, in all of our communities. 
David, so FBI and DHS have already provided information to state and local authorities, but the state and local law enforcement aren't going to be waiting for DHS and FBI. They're going to be assessing what events, uh, what security needs are, are necessary within their own communities. The public should expect to see increased police presence, particularly mass transit around so-called soft targets. Uh, and in big cities, I think that police presence will be pretty significant. All right. We'll be continuing this discussion in just a moment. It's worth noting that U.S. intelligence officials saying tonight, and this is, goes to what Brian was saying, absolutely no chatter pointing to any attack in Paris. So this caught French officials as well as, as, well as American officials totally off guard. As we go to break here, Elizabeth, we want to show you an incredibly moving scene that came in from that stadium. You know, all those soccer fans leaving 80,000 spontaneously beginning to sing the French national anthem as they left the stadium. Live now, back on the air, 2020, with live a coverage of the attacks in Paris, terrorist attacks hitting the city of light tonight, making it a city under siege. Six different attacks targeting a soccer stadium, a concert hall, several restaurants. We are getting reports that there are at least 153 people reported dead and that all the attackers involved are believed dead four of them inside that concert hall. And the key thing here, Elizabeth, is that three of those died by suicide belt, which was one of the biggest fears. As we know, Paris was set to uh, host the climate conference in just a couple of weeks mm. with leaders from around the world, including President Obama, and the real fear were these soft targets. And of course, we're getting word that there was no hint of any kind of chatter about a, an attack in Paris, either from American intelligence sources or from French intelligence sources. Tonight here in New York City, the World Trade Center One is bathed in the French colors, blue, white, and red, in honor of the French and what they are undergoing tonight. In addition, security has been increased in certain sites around the city. So joining us right now is New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio on what Homeland Security is doing with this threat. Uh, and whether or not there's more security around in, in Manhattan and what we're doing. Good night. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Well, we definitely are on high alert here in New York City, and we have our counterterrorism officers out at key locations around the city, including, obviously, the French mission to the UN and the French consulate. We're making sure that there's real presence there and in other key areas around the city, heavily populated, heavily trafficked areas tonight to reassure the people of this city. Mayor de Blasio, I know one of the real concerns, though, is the chatter and that we rely so much uh, in this era on intelligence. You know, Brian Ross was reporting earlier that in France there are uh, many ISIS sympathizers that they're tracking. Hundreds have gone to Syria, but uh, the larger number are still in France. And uh, the concern here in America and in the city the size of New York City is that we have the intelligence before they can pull off a coordinated attack like this inside soft targets across the city. Look, we know it's a real challenge. We're, we're very confident in the intelligence uh, gathering capacity of the NYPD, and we work very closely with the FBI, Homeland Security, et cetera. And I can tell you uh, there's many situations where we've been able to track suspected people and get ahead of the situation. So that uh, capacity has worked to date. But here in the city, we've invested in over 1,500 counterterrorism officers trained specifically to deal with both trying to stop any situation like this, and God forbid we have one, we have the capacity to get them in play immediately to address a situation like this. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, in general, we have seen that there's uh, some kind of prior indication, but we're also living in an age where there's some lone wolf attacks that there's no warning for. So the ability to respond immediately with well-trained, well-equipped officers is a key part of our strategy. But in, we obviously saw in Paris soft targets attacked with great efficiency tonight. How in, in, other, in this great city of New York City, but in cities around the nation, do you protect all those soft targets, those football games this weekend, those concerts that are taking place every place in this, in, in this country? Look, in our case, there certainly be substantial presence at some of the key events and some of the key places in this city. I think the bottom line is this, again, a lot of preventative efforts that happen every day. We've been vigilant as a city since 9-11. Literally for 14 years, we've lived in a state of heightened vigilance. We've continued to build our counterterrorism capacity. I think the answer is there's key locations, key events that naturally are going to get additional coverage. 
but it's also the ability to respond very quickly. If God forbid something happens at an unexpected soft target, uh, the fact is we have uh, officers ready to deploy very, very quickly, again, with sufficient armament, sufficient training to address it. I think that's the model we have to depend on going forward. The intelligence work often, in fact, overwhelming a case, number of cases, will catch these uh, attempted efforts and will give us the opportunity to stop them. But if we're going to be in an age where some things aren't seen in time or where lone wolves are acting, the ability to have that immediate rapid response with well-trained, well-equipped officers is going to be crucial. New York City has that. I think other places are probably going to need that as well. Mayor de Blasio, with just a few moments left, though, what do you say to folks who are watching tonight who, who might be just feeling uneasy, worrying that it's only a matter of time, really, here? We know there are lone wolves in this country as well. What do you say to them, and does it keep you up at night when you see what played out in Paris today? Look, it, it's something that worries me every day, but I also know uh, that the track record of this country and uh, certainly of the NYPD since 9-11, over 14 years, has been extraordinary. Identifying potential threats, stopping them before they could be achieved, uh, constantly working to improve our capacity. Uh, I think, in fact, there's a lot of reasons that people should be confident in the security capacity of certainly this city and this nation. But look, again, with a lone wolf situation, we simply have to be vigilant. We have to recognize any suspicious activity uh, should be re uh, reported to the police very quickly. We've said in New York City for a long time, if you see something, say something. That phrase takes on a lot of meaning in the age of lone wolf attacks. And that means we have a chance potentially to stop them if you know, our fellow citizens are able to report to the police things that they see. Look, uh, tonight is a night to think about the people of Paris who have gone through so much, not just these horrible attacks, but what they went through in January. I was there in the aftermath of the January attacks. Uh, this whole world's heart is with Paris tonight. But I think the answer for all of us is to support our police and inform uh, everything we see, provide that information to the police promptly. Mayor de Blasio here in New York City. Mayor, thanks for being with us here tonight. And uh, he makes a great point. President Obama saying earlier today, we stand with France. Vice President Biden tweeting out, our hearts are with the people of France. And uh, it's nice to see one world trade in the colors of the French people tonight. It is indeed. Pictures from Paris tonight, of course, in the middle of the night there. And as we've talked with eyewitnesses, some who escaped the terror today, saying they simply cannot sleep tonight. And we understand that over here in America as we watch it unfold. And we're going to take a look at this newest front that we've been talking a lot about here, Elizabeth, tonight. These so-called soft targets, mm -hmm. not the battlefield anymore. Uh, the streets, the locations of everyday life. Football concerts, games, right. Concerts. Uh, restaurants, simple restaurants, where they mm -hmm. simply drove by and began attacking people sitting inside. And so with a look at the soft targets, and the concern here in America, here's our Chief Global Affairs Correspondent, Martha Raddatz, tonight. Martha? David, this is the nightmare scenario. Terrorists going after those soft targets and tonight's play into everyone's fears. That sporting event, a theater, a restaurant. Tonight, the United States standing in solidarity with its French allies, New York's Freedom Tower lit in the colors of the French flag. All across the country tonight, cities are on high alert the New York Police Department working overtime. But that's what you'll, you'll see in New York, uh, a deployment of what's called uh, critical response vehicles to locations, not only to add security, but also to raise the comfort level. That heavy artillery is a show of force at New York's most visible targets, Statue of Liberty, Lincoln Center, and of course, Times Square will deploy resources at sensitive locations. The reality is that there are a lot more sensitive locations and there are resources to, uh, uh, to cover them. And that is arguably what the terrorists are counting on. And now in light of the attacks in Paris, especially the one near that soccer stadium, sports venues are taking proactive measures this weekend. Meanwhile, the NBA and NHL warning all teams and arenas to be extra vigilant. But the NFL, which has huge sold-out stadiums, isn't beefing up security. Security at our games is always at a heightened state of alert, said NFL spokesman Brian McCarthy, pointing out that every NFL stadium is already equipped with metal detectors. And while former New York Police Commissioner concedes MetLife Stadium, home to the New York Giants and Jets, is prepared, all of them might not be. 
um, metal detectors are used in, in some places. Uh, I believe there is an effort to have it done in all major league venues, but I don't think it's there yet. But truly less protected, softer targets like movie theaters and shopping malls are extremely vulnerable. Remember the siege on that mall in Kenya, heavily armed gunmen strolling through, picking off victims one by one, including this security guard cowering in fear. I think they knew they had a soft target. They knew the authorities would not respond quickly. A quiet night on Manhattan's Upper West Side, a lone security guard patrolling along with a few shoppers at the Gap. People catching a movie or a late dinner. At the Lincoln Center subway stop, no sign of increased security. It's horrifying. It reminds me of, you know, the Charlie Hebro thing and, you know, just everything else that's going on in the world that we have no control over. It wasn't an attack on Paris, it was an attack on um, humanity is, and that's kind of scary. There are bad people in the world. I'm not sure we can stop all of them. Uh, we can try, but uh, there's going to be attacks like this. They're random. They're isolated. Uh, the eight million people in New York, you can't keep an eye on eight million people. The risk of being killed in a terrorist attack is still about equivalent to the risk of being killed in a shark attack. This woman is a tourist visiting New York from San Francisco. The parks are always busy, always so crowded during those games. I live near one of those stadiums. How can I avoid that unless I moved? And if I moved, I wouldn't be able to go to work easily. So it's kind of a catch-22 in my opinion. So. The Department of Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson says tonight DHS and the FBI are closely monitoring events in Paris, but he says we know of no specific or credible threats of an attack on the U.S. homeland of the type that occurred in Paris tonight. Of course, there were no specific threats in Paris either. These are the kind of attackers who are not only hard to detect, but very hard to stop. Elizabeth and David. Indeed, Martha, and you were talking about the resignation of many of the people in Martha's piece had about we can't really protect ourselves. A recent poll early this month said that 73% of Americans called it very or somewhat likely that in the near future there will be a terrorist attack in the United States causing large numbers of lives to be lost. We have former police commissioner Ray Kelly from New York City here joining us. When you hear New Yorkers and people in every city in this country and around the world talking about sort of resigned, how do we stop it? I mean, we can't change the way we live, right? We can't change the way we live, but I think we're doing a pretty good job. When you look at the attacks that we had in this country since 9-11, they're negligible. We had the Ford Hood shootings, those types of events. But we certainly haven't had anything that looks like uh, anything close to what we saw in Paris. And you said tonight what we're seeing is very common to what we've seen in previous attacks. We thought there was a, b a big number of attackers because of the scope of it, and it's actually shrunk down. Yeah, this is particularly disturbing because you can see the amount of mayhem that's done by a small number of people. Dick Clark talked before about the Mumbai attack. That was just 10 attackers, over 400 people killed and wounded. Here we have, it looks like, five or six killing 200 people. So there's always an estimate there's a lot more, and then you get down to the, the final analysis. It's a few people with AK-47s, very basic weapons, killing lots of uh, individuals. And, Commissioner, you were telling Elizabeth and me during the break that it, it would appear at this point that the French police should be applauded for responding fairly right. quickly to this. But as we heard Martha say, there was very little chatter leading up to this, which is so concerning. No chatter, really? With the fear of lone wolves here in our country. So how do we track them and how can we be sure that, that, we, that we're monitoring them all? With great difficulty and we can't be sure. Yeah. <clears throat> You're right, there's sometimes just not going to be any chatter at all. You do the best you can. And I think law enforcement in this country has done a very good job, but it has been said so many times, they only have to be right once, we have to be, be right, right all the all time. The time. Right. All right, former Commissioner Kelly, always great to have you with us here. And Elizabeth and I have much more ahead, but we're going to take a break for our local stations to preview what's coming up in many cases on their own local newscast. 15 seconds here from our local stations. We're back now on 2020, our live coverage of Paris under attack. And we want to bring in Andy Scott, a journalist who was actually inside that stadium. And it was simply stunning to see. It was France and Germany, this giant rivalry. 
And then I think you'll see here the moment, the bomb, mm -hmm. uh, the explosion outside, and people looking at one another. We could see them hugging inside simply in disbelief afterward. But Andy, where were you uh, when you could mm -hmm. actually hear this? Uh, good morning. Yeah, I was um, I was in the stadium. I was in the press box of the stadium, uh, which is a you know an enormous stadium with a capacity of eighty thousand uh, on the on the other side of the stadium from where these uh, two very loud explosions could be heard about five minutes apart during the first half of the game. Um, so yeah, I was in the stadium. Um, you know, there was it was pretty clear very quickly that those explosions were not uh, anything normal, but. Um, Things carried on until the end of the game, and, and it was, you know, it took a long time for things to be clear as to just how serious uh, it was. There's an iconic image now. Uh, it only took a matter of moments for the world to see President Hollande put his hand to his face. He was in the stadium. They had to evacuate him uh, very quickly. Uh, but how long was it before people had a true grasp of what was unfolding across the city? Yeah, um, well, within the stadium, it obviously took some time. I mean, the situations like that it is difficult because. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware that, you know, sometimes when you have so many people in such a small space, sometimes the telephone networks don't work as well as, 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 as otherwise they might do. So I think, you know, communication can sometimes be a little bit complicated these times. But obviously, uh, 20, 30 minutes after we heard these two explosions uh, during the game, uh, it, you know, I was able to make a couple of calls, contact my desk, and, and it, it began to emerge. And I'm sure this would be the case for many people within the stadium that obviously, you know, very serious events were happening, not just around the stadium, but within the, the, in the centre of the city as well. Uh, so it would have been the same for people within, within the stadium, but it's important to, to underline the fact that, you know, this game continued until the finish, uh, and the, the general atmosphere remained very calm. There was no mass hysteria, no mass panic. There was some confusion at the end of the match when, um, when they tried to, when people were leaving the stadium, and uh, they clearly blocked a number of the exits for obvious reasons because there had been explosions outside the ground. So, so there was less space for people, a huge number of people, to, ev to, to leave the stadium. And that meant there were a lot of people on the pitch where the game had taken place. And, and there was some confusion, but no panic. Uh, so, you know, people by that point were realising what was going on. But, you know, the stadium is about uh, five miles or so to the north of, of the centre of the city. But despite that, you know, the, the trains and metro and so on was running normally. Right. So things carried on. But it was, it was, there was no hysteria, just uh, confusion and, and slow realization as to what was going on. I was just going to ask, how do, all those people that were seeing those images, they all got down finally, the spectators, onto the soccer field where the game had been played. Was that in an mm -hmm. effort uh, to get to safety and security because nobody really knew what was happening in the stands and in the hallways of the uh, stadium? I think I think that I think that would be unf it's very easy to look at these images and and come to the conclusion that things was things were disorganized there were all kinds of problems it was more I think a case of um a realization that when you have so many people trying to leave the stadium and and so many exits blocked off uh clearly you're going to get a situation where you have too many people trying to leave through the same exits and I think a lot of these people were just waiting for things to calm down there was no you know, people people were standing and, and being calm and on on the pitch, just waiting for for things to, to 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 clear up in terms of the number of people around there. So there was no, this wasn't. You know, it'd be wrong to describe this as evac as evacuation, as panic, anything like that. This was just a case of a huge number of All people right. trying to leave via a smaller number of exits because uh, clearly the, the 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 gates that are often used to let people out were right next to where these explosions had right. taken place. All right, Andy Scott. Thank you for joining us tonight for a summary of what happened in that other attack tonight the in that stadium. Some, the bravery of so many and eyewitnesses tonight. the calmness, tonight. too, of everybody yeah, of in this. Everybody. Under and as we say goodnight, one more major development, that of the eight terrorists who were killed after these attacks, seven of them killed themselves with suicide belts, mm -hmm. perhaps a new chapter uh, in this front on terror. We're going to leave you tonight with the images from Paris throughout uh, the evening. It's now early morning there. Your local news is coming up with much more on this Nightline later. And, of course, we'll be covering this all weekend long here. For Elizabeth Vargas and all of us here at ABC News, I'm David Muir. Have a good evening. I was, you know, enjoying the concert and the, the band playing, you know, they were in the middle of a song. And then all of a sudden we heard shots.
nobody can justify what they did. It feels like a never-ending horror movie.